were you born? In Doylestown, in 1919, they tell me. <laughs> um, I uh, went to the public school in Doylestown, and then I uh, had uh, three years at Buckingham Prince School. And from there, I went to uh, George School for high school. When did you get involved in the railroading? This is this is early as I can, my memory span goes. Hmm. I can date things back to 1923 when the, the uh, turntable was eliminated at Doylestown. I used to watch the men push the locomotive on the turntable around. And what uh, stimulated my interest in, in the railroading was uh, the fact that I found the magazine, Railroad Man's Magazine, uh, at a uh, news agency in Chambersburg. As we were, my folks and I stopped there overnight and that uh, st stimulated my interest to uh, at a point when the Reading Railroad at the same time was progressing on planning electrification of certain suburban lines. And uh, on, on that account is what uh, prompted my first engine picture as uh, outlined by the uh, International Engine Picture Club, which was published in this magazine. Knowing that the steam would be going out in the following summer, which was uh, July of 1931, uh, I continued to take locomotive photographs. And uh, for the first time, uh, corresponded with uh, certain names that had appeared in this magazine uh, of having the same hobby and interest. That was a start and expanded to many, many different facets of railroading. First fan trip or railroad inspection trip that I was on was uh, merely a, a special car put on by the B&O on their out of Jersey City to Halethorpe, Maryland, which was a, a, a visit to the uh, site of the Fair of the Iron Horse, which the buildings are still remaining then, and the equipment was stored at, at Halethorpe, where the fair had been held. That was in 1934, during Thanksgiving vacation. That group of visited Halethorpe. I was next to the youngest person among them. Carl Schlachter, Jr. was the younger one. He was a, he was about eleven or so, and I was uh, fifteen. And one person who would be responsible for. The early trips was uh, Tom Thomas T. Tabor. I saw for the first time what could be done in running my own trains years years later. Those people like uh, Tom Tabor, who was a pioneer in, in certain phases of the railroad hobby that uh, few few people uh, did. I've always been interested in the railroads as long as I can remember. And then, of course, the chap chapter two was the start of taking locomotive photographs. And of course, among, among, among us all are the people, the different people that you have met, some railroaders, sometimes the officials, sometimes the track walkers. If I hadn't had the experience of knowing the, the man who bought the Lehigh Valley inspection engine, the Dorothy, 
if I hadn't actually seen seen his Dor the Dorothy under steam and under under uh, uh, operation, I wouldn't have been as likely to go into the trouble of uh, <laughs> buying some myself. And I was surprised that I was actually one of the very, very few who were, were buying steam locomotives. Well, I'm old enough to remember very clearly a ride on the Switchback Railroad. That was in 1928. And uh, uh, there aren't very many rider alumni <laughs> of the Switchback left. It was in 1933 that uh, the uh, switchbacks stopped its operation at the end of the season, which is October 31st. Their, their season ran from Memorial Day to the last day in October, was their regular schedule. 1933 was the last they operated, and it wasn't until September 1937 that uh, the uh, Switchback was put up for sale for scrap. In fact, in 19, on October 31st, 1937, Frank Hoffman and Hugh Gibb and myself hiked the, the whole 18 miles. One experience which I'll never, never forget. I was at George School then as an employee. I took the Newtown local to Wayne Junction. I took a mainline train from North Broad to Norristown. And in Norristown, I changed over to the Sunday only Perky Omen local. Sunday only, which ran all the way straight through to Allentown during gas rationing. Had three cars. I got to Allentown, and then I got the Jersey Central local to to, to Mock Chunk had uh, dinner at the diner, which is an old Lehigh Valley dining car, and then uh, took the next train to Hazelton. By that time, it was about uh, uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. I wanted to get the next train back. He had five cars. And he had transferred uh, two of those cars to the uh, to the Reading of Bethlehem for their Sunday connection. Went into uh, to uh, Reading, Reading Terminal. While I was there, waiting for the Sunday only Newtown train is left at 9.30. One of the engineers, his nickname's Bell Ringer, Sammy Bellmeyer, he said the Pensies had a bad wreck at Frankfurt Junction. He said everything is going around it. So uh, anyway, I took that Newtown local and we got off at George School where I was working got on my bicycle and uh, went to Woodburn on the New York branch of the Reading between, uh, between West Trenton and Langhorn. That's where the Trenton Cutoff crosses over top of the Reading tracks. So you can see the trains at both railroads at the same spot. There was one train that had a Lehigh Valley engine on it. And I heard, heard he whistled down down the down the track there and I said to myself, That's White Haven. That's White Haven, that sounds like White <laughs> Sure enough it was a yeah, Valley Pacific. Pulling a GG one and about twelve or fourteen cars. In fact every other train was a with a GG one and a passenger train. Several L ones two eight twos on 
pulling troop trains. Troop trains were going toward New York, and there were two, I'm sure there were prisoners' trains coming this way with old B and A equipment in Boston and Maine equipment like Strasburg uses. Because those cars were lit. There was a soldier in uniform with a Tommy gun at each door. And there was one person to a seat, but every other seat was staggered, empty. And these, these fellows were the, they were mostly blonde, so I figured they were German. About quarter of three, uh, everything went quiet. And the section man came out. And he says, there must be something important going to come up because I've been instructed to put the locks on the baggage trucks in front of the station at Woodburn. And then there's the Jersey Central Mikado came through by itself, a light engine, and they ran usually about five minutes ahead of the special, whatever it was. There were six cars on it, all wasn't a speck of dirt on them. Canadian, all Canadian, all six were Canadian Pacific in maroon. And I read in the paper the next day that Churchill had arrived in Washington. <laughs> so that was that was the the night to remember. How did you get started with the rail tours and uh, the steam engines? Well, that was mostly. Uh, inspired from the Reading Iron Horse Rambles, uh, which the first one of which was operated in October of 1959. I was closely associated with the, with the Rambles as a freelance person. One thing I did for the, uh, with the Rambles was to <laughs> what I call, I wrote the whistle script, <laughs> which was a suggestion of whistleblowing at places other than required. And the idea was make the most of public relations along the countryside, as well as to the hearing of the passengers. Wouldn't really tire of the whistle. In fact, some said that the, that's what they came to take the ride for, was to hear the <laughs> whistle blow. And this business grew to the point where it became desirable to uh, incorporate. So rail tours became incorporated in 1962 and hit upon Jim Sorp as a base station, so to speak. Although we had earlier been operating out of, on the Maryland and Pennsylvania Railroad, out of York, Pennsylvania, with the Pacific type, Canadian Pacific locomotives, which were bought from the railroad at Winnipeg in 1963. 1286 and 1238 of the Canadian Pacific cost $5,000 a piece. <laughs> but it cost just as much to get them from Winnipeg to York. That bill, freight bill, was about just about $5,000. One of the 1286 was, had been put, a, put aside for Operation Standby after it was shopped in January of 57. It was built in 1948. It was a comparatively new steam engine. Went through the shop once and was never called on until I and Boilermaster Ben Kantner uh, picked it off a scrap line at Winnipeg. And this locomotive had 
certificates to operate on either the United States or Canada could do that on the Sioux line. You were lucky if you broke even. You had a decent price. The rule that I had for, for fair for price at York, which was constituted of trips over the Western Maryland Railway, was that the be, be one dollar for every hour of travel time. In other words, if the train were, uh, took 10 hours on the schedule, then it would be ten dollars would be the fare. I do hit upon that as being reasonable. Well, that varied a great deal. Uh, uh, from York to Hagerstown, Maryland, 79 miles, a round trip. Uh, it was run around between 25 to 2,800. And of course, bearing in mind that also that the Western Maryland people invited me over to run on their track. And I met the, met the Western Maryland people quite by accident. I was watching water in the 1286, which was stationed on the, on the Maryland Pennsylvania Railroad at York on Memorial Day morning. And there were two gentlemen came around with very expensive cameras and uh, they asked me, are you George Hart? I said I was. And it was George Lalick of the Western Maryland, and it was Russell Wilcox of the Pensy. And uh, George Lalick said, one of the things he said to me was, uh, after he had looked the engine over, he said, uh, did you ever think of running offline, off the Maryland and Pennsylvania? I said, oh no, I said, uh, the railroads wouldn't be interested in that. Well, he says, I'm in the position I have to know that we are. <laughs> and that was the start of my offline trips, one in the Western Maryland and other places also. I think the event of bringing the 972 down from Winnipeg to uh, York it was quite a experience, especially when I got to Buffalo. It was put over the hump yard, and uh, the result was that uh, the uh, back tender was crushed by incoming freight car drifting down the down the road. By the time I found out where it was, I drove up to to Buffalo, and. Uh, so what happened, had a uh, man in charge of the engine house there and the repair, they were working on it. And he gave the uh, train master, I guess it was, a tongue lashing, which I'll never forget. And uh, said, don't let this ever happen again. Well, it did happen again, only this time it was a front coupler. Well. The roundhouse foreman was fit to be tied, and he told the train master, he says, I'm taking the knuckle off the big hook to put on that engine, because that's the only size there is here. And I don't care if you have a wreck or not without a coupler on there, it's gone on the 972. So the coupler on the 972 is still on, as far as I know. That served you uh, well over the years, that engine, huh? Yes. It's very, uh, it's my favorite, favorite engine. It, it always did a little more than what you expected it could, it could do.
and the uh, museum was being planned e extensively in, in the middle of the 1960s. In fact, that's when uh, the uh, Commonwealth uh, bought the property at Strasbourg. I was involved in some of the discussions as to the location of the uh, of the museum, whether it would be uh, in Altoona or uh, located along the East Broadtop or Strasbourg. Well, in the first place, uh, uh, you had to ask the commissioners what requirements, what their requirements were and what the requirements of the, uh, principally the Pennsylvania Railroad were. One commission requirement was that they wanted the museum to be located at an operating steam operation, which was East Broadtop and Strasburg. So that was one thing which, of course, was not in favor of. Altoona. One of the requirements of the Pennsylvania Railroad was that it should be located along the uh, main line of, of their railroad between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, Some, somewhere, anywhere between those, those places, which Williamsport, for instance, had uh, pegged itself for the museum site. Well, that would throw out Williamsport as a, as a qualified location. As far as I was concerned, it was between East Broadtop and Stras Strasburg because uh, Altoona could not qualify. It, it had no established steam operation. Now, you were named the first director, I believe. Yes. Yes, I was founding founding director of the museum. And did you have any facilities when you were first came into office? I had a de <laughs> I had a desk, <laughs> and the uh, uh, office was actually was first at the in the uh, historical museum commission headquarters at Harrisburg. Uh, I was there until uh, nineteen. Uh, 75. Well, the, the first thing that was uh, put in the new, new museum was a turntable. That was put in in 1970. 1975, the uh, main building was completed, uh, but uh, was o opened in, in about 36 hours' notice. Uh, uh, in 1975. I was appointed uh, in uh, June of 1969 and was the first employee uh, of, the, uh, of the museum site. The, the second person hired was a security officer who was always on the outside. There was no building, but some of the locomotives had been placed on the property. And uh, uh, the third person was a maintenance maintenance uh, engineer. Uh, maintenance was, of the engines, or uh, or maintenance of the buildings and grounds. Buildings and grounds. Which there was no building at that point. No. <laughs> That's right. Well, of course, the whole collection we really had to fight for because it had been promised to St. Louis. If St. Louis had built a, had a building built by 19, January 1st, 1970, then the, the collection was more or less theirs. But uh, then uh, uh, came toward that time and uh, there were apparent no apparent signs that the 
building was underway. So then uh, there was a division of the collection that was made. Just all of this, of course, is just on paper and talk. So certain items went to St. Louis and certain were to go to Strasbourg. But then the, the deadline date for their housing was up and uh, uh, the collection was mostly housed in Northumberland, Pennsylvania, and the engine, engine house facilities there. Northumberland was without a third trick, I like to call it third trick, uh, which meant that the place was wide open for eight hours of the 24. Uh, we were to have the, the, the whole collection by that time, but if they could uh, possibly move the engines down where we could give them 24 hours security at the, at the Strasbourg, uh, it would be a much safer thing for the collection rather than to be exposed. And that they did move down in what I call the locomotive train. Uh, I just forget the, not the entire number of locomotives, but uh, it was quite a sight. Well, I should say a little bit about uh, Mock Chunk here. There was an excursion I read in the newspaper account from Doylestown and Lansdale and Quakertown and Bethlehem in 1859, which was before the Civil War. And apparently it was way late getting back. It was two or three o'clock in the morning by the time they got to return to Doylestown, which uh, the newspaper correspondent said that the it gave the passengers a chance to breathe some cool, fresh air on their way home <laughs> at that time of the morning. And the excursion business grew to the extent, all of which, of course, was stimulated by the abandonment of hauling coal on the, on the switchback in, in 1870. In fact, it got in the 1890s and in the 1900s or so, it got so so uh, voluminous that uh, the railroads, the Jersey Central on one side and the Lehigh Valley on the other side of the river here in town um, had to divide their, their schedules. So the Jersey Central would take it one Sunday and the Lehigh Valley would be the next. In the same way, an alternating on holidays because there just wasn't the, the capacity of the town to absorb all that come in on these excursions on s certain days, especially the Memorial Day and Fourth of July. It was prearranged by to uh, Francis Stocker, who was superintendent of the Lehigh Susquehanna Division of the Jersey Central to uh, come here and locate in Mock Chunk Yard, which had just been officially closed on September 1st, uh, 1971. And we came here with the trips were over at Bethlehem in the evening of Labor Day night, around 10 o'clock, and there were just about five people who saw the train come in. The uh, town was practically dead. There was only one one person walking the streets. In fact, uh, for uh, about a week, the uh, captions in the newspapers of a picture of the steam locomotive at Jim's Art uh, yielded no information as to who who owned it or <laughs> why it was there. <laughs> it's just that much of a quiet mystery for a while. <laughs>